We're back with part two of dealing with the heteroscedasticity problem. Uh, so again, this corresponds to chapter 10 of the Studentman intro textbook and a chapter nine, pretty sure, of the Wooldridge introductory textbook. So if you recall, where we left off, we had gone through our discussion of the implications of estimating an OLS model with a heteroscedastic error. The big issue is our coefficients are unbiased, but the variance and the standard error, the t stats, the p values, all of our coefficient level hypothesis testing information is invalid. So that led us to our statistical tests for the presence of heteroscedasticity. And we had three of them, right? The Park test, the White test, and the Bruch Pagan test. Uh, so, our kind of the summary here what we should be able to do in each of those cases, be able to interpret and describe uh, kind of the visual evidence of heteroscedasticity using the residual plot, the squared residual plot, what we call the eyeball test for heteroscedasticity, be able to recognize that uh, from Stata output or R Studio output uh, and see the, the story that that tells. Uh, and then the test equations and the output from each of those three tests. Be familiar with that, be comfortable with it, how to use it, how to recognize it, how to interpret the results. So now this leaves us with just one issue unresolved. How do we fix the problem? How do we get results that are valid out of a regression model that contains a heteroscedastic error? So we'll look at three possibilities here. Uh, Item number one, it's kind of a little bit of a, a Hail Mary pass, as it were. It's worth a shot. Let's just make sure that we've got the correct specification for our model. It turns out some uh, linear, uh, I'm sorry, nonlinear transformations can actually mitigate the heteroscedasticity problem. When that doesn't work, we go for the full weighted least squares transformation. And we'll see how that works, when it works, when it doesn't, how to do it in Stata. And then lastly, we can recalculate those variances and standard errors such that we use a formula that is valid in the presence of heteroscedasticity, that doesn't assume, that doesn't require a homoscedastic error, and that's going to be our robust standard error option. So let's take a look at option number one, uh, this idea of re-specifying our model. Remember the concept of the most common form that heteroscedasticity takes, that there is a size or a scale or a proportionality factor such that when that size or scale rises, the variability of our dependent variable, the variance of the error term, rises as well. Well, if there is kind of an obvious variable that fits that description, that acts as that size or scale factor, and there is an intuitive reason to do so, we can scale our data, scale our observations of our dependent variable by this size factor. So particularly what we're thinking about here are going from total values to per capita values, right? So when we think about trying to predict gross domestic product, of course, countries with more output have more variability. So if we scale it by size, measured by population, measuring per capita GDP, that scale factor disappears. Thinking about uh, instead of total household expenditures, think about, well, how much do people spend as a proportion of their income? Right? So scale spending by income level. And likewise, instead of trying to predict total output, try to predict output per worker, scale by size. Now, obviously, you're, it's going to depend on what you're trying to do here, whether or not this is going to be a good idea, but sometimes there are these intuitive, reasonable transformations that we can do that still provide the information that we want, variables that make sense per capita, per worker, proportional variables. So that's going to be kind of a first stop, at least think that through, whether or not that's going to be a good option. The other thing that we mean by respecification is applying some of the nonlinear transformations that we've seen in previous discussions. In particular, the log transformation, the natural log transformation, can have a 
an almost an unintended side benefit of mitigating heteroscedasticity. So think about where this log transformation model came up in our previous discussions, right? We thought about it as a reaction or a correction to positive skew in the distribution of our variables, in the sample distribution of our variables, meaning we had more variability above the mean than below the mean with that positive skew. So with that log transformation, with that kind of built-in diminishing returns effect that is generated, what it does is it reduces that right-hand tail of the distribution. It reduces dispersion of large values. Well, now that we start to think about it in the context of this size proportionality factor heteroscedasticity issue, that's what we want. We want dispersion between different observations that are large to be reduced. So a log transformation can actually have that effect on the error term. So think about, I don't think there's no, there's no backstory to these graphs, sorry about that, uh, but this is calling back from our, our previous example where we're using education to predict wage and the plot on the right is the, the eyeball test from the wage model where we have the squared error as a function of education. And remember what we saw was, well, there seems to be a positive relationship here as education rises, variability in wage also rises. That was our evidence of heteroscedasticity. Well, on the left, this is from the same regression using education to predict wage, but after a log transformation has been applied. Now, we still see an upward slope here, but it's much less dramatic, right? We see, except for this observation here, we see all of this wide dispersion brought down. Okay? So it seems to help with the problem in this case. Not quite enough to solve it, though, right? But we can at least see the impact that this log transformation is having on these variance estimates the squared errors, the squared residuals. Okay. If we go back and actually uh, retest the log model for heteroscedasticity, so this is log wage as a function of log education, log work experience, then we rerun the, uh, the Bruce Pagan test. This is the het test command in Stata. So there's a whole nother video tutorial on that that you're gonna wanna check out. And what we're looking for is significance here, so we have an F stat of 8.12, still highly significant. The, the evidence that this was at all helpful is just that in the linear model, running this uh, same test gave us an F stat of over 16. So we brought it down by half, but it's still significant. So in this case, we definitely need to do more to solve this heteroscedasticity problem, but we can at least see the log transformation is helpful. And in some cases, it'll be enough to apply the transformation, retest, and then you'll find you no longer have significant uh, heteroscedasticity. Then you can go ahead and move on. You can now interpret your coefficients uh, and their significance levels as you would normally do. But in our case, in this example, it wasn't quite enough, and we definitely need to have some alternative solutions. So that takes us to, in our little list, Option number two, the weighted least squares approach. Now, in a sense, this is exactly what we were just referring to in the first respecification option when we said, well, let's just divide everything by the scale factor, by proportionality factor, whether it's dividing by population uh, or the number of workers, whatever the case is, and that is weighting our variables, and that might solve the problem. Well, the only difference between that and what we're calling the weighted least squares option here is that here we do this even if the new variable doesn't necessarily have an intuitive meaning. So it's not necessarily looking for per capita GDP or consumption proportional to income. This approach is saying whatever the scale or size factor is that is causing heteroscedasticity, let's 
apply the mathematical transformation that will use that information to remove that heteroscedastic component, regardless of whether or not the resulting variables make intuitive sense. Okay? But hey, conceptually, it's similar to exactly what we, what we already mentioned. So it's the same basic idea as that scale factor. We want to reduce the weight placed on observations with the larger error variance, divide through by that size or scale or, in general, heteroscedasticity causing variable. And the end result here is that we'll have the weighted least squares, WLS estimator, that are more efficient, still unbiased, with valid standard errors, variances, and t-stats, and smaller variances, actually more accurate than OLS in the presence of heteroscedasticity. And even though the variables are going to look a little funny, we'll still maintain the same interpretation, the same meaning of our slope coefficients, our marginal effect estimates. Now, just a word of uh, warning here, I'm not going to go through the proof here of efficiency showing that weighted least squares is more efficient than OLS. We're just going to walk through kind of the logic, the mechanics uh, of applying this. But you trust me, you'll take my word for that. Okay, so how are we going to make this work? Well, much like how we applied a first difference or a generalized difference transformation to correct for autocorrelation in a time series model, in order to apply this transformation here, we need to have an assumed functional form for exactly how this heteroscedasticity happens. It's not enough just to say, oh, variance goes up or variance goes down. We need to know exactly how it differs across observations. And the key word, of course, is that this is an assumption that we are making, right? The true functional form of this error variance is unknown, but if we can get close enough to it, we can actually apply this and make it work. So this is the question we're trying to answer, right? How does the error variance change across observations? What is the process that drives that differentiation? So some of this notation should be familiar from our previous discussion, right? When we see a sigma squared sub i, that's the variance of the error term for observation i. When we see that sub i, we, that's telling us we have heteroscedasticity. This is different from observation 2 to observation 3, etc. So what we're saying now is this error variance is going to be a function of some variable z. As z goes up and down, sigma squared goes up and down across observations. So just having this component here is an assumption. It's saying we know what variable is driving this differentiation. And we may get to that information, right, by saying we have our result from the park test, right? We know which variable was most significant in determining variation in the squared residuals. So that's, that's plausible. We could get that. Now this next step is another leap in terms of levels of assumptions. What we're saying is that the variation in the error variance, the sigma squared, is entirely attributed to this scale effect. So there is underlying each observation's variance a constant factor, call it sigma squared, and that is scaled up or down based on some additional function, call it g of z. But underneath it all, there's this common core component of each observation's error variance. So this z variable is our scale variable, our causal factor. And you see what, what this assumption buys us, right? What this tells us is, ah, if only we could cancel out that g of z effect. Underneath it all is this constant sigma squared. Well, that getting to that point is exactly what weighted least squares is designed to do. But the point, the main point from this slide is that this is all by assumption, right? We don't have any proof necessarily that there is this common factor 
sigma squared that is scaled up and down. But if it does act like this, and we know what z is, we know how that scale operation operates, this, uh, you know, I'm kind of talking this out of this, but it is plausible, right? We could approximate this and actually get this to work. But it's kind of built on a house of cards in terms of this assumption. Right? So how are we going to make this work? Let's look at kind of a generic example. So our original model, just a simple OLS model, y as a function of x, and our error term ui. So what's going on with our error term? We assume we have a heteroscedastic error, so the variance of ui varies across observations, sigma squared sub i, and the weighted least squares assumption is that there's this underlying co uh, constant sigma squared value that is scaled by this g of z. Now, for the purposes of this example, let's imagine that g of z is z squared. So that's the function that scales up and down that constant value. It could be z, it could be the square root of z, it could be log of z, it could be 1 over z to the third power. We don't know what it is, but we're assuming that we, we have an approximation here in this example. Let's call it z squared. So now, this next step is the weighting process, right? So we will weight each term in our original model by z, not z squared, which is the g of z, but by z. So we basically we divide that entire equation by z, so we have a new dependent variable, y divided by z, a new intercept term, which is now b0 is the, very, uh, the coefficient on this ratio, 1 over z. Our new explanatory variable is weighted, x divided by z, and the whole point is we have a new error term, u divided by z, the error term weighted by this factor. Now, just a quick note, this could be GDP divided by population. It could be something like that that makes sense. It could be output divided by the number of workers. And this would match our original kind of idea, but it doesn't have to be. Y can be anything, z can be anything, as long as it fits this assumption. Okay, so now, to drive this home, how does this new weighted error term, u over z, how does this help us out? What we can show fairly quickly is that the variance of this weighted error term will be sigma squared, will be constant, if that original assumption was true. So let's take the variance of our weighted error term, the variance of u over z, and as long as that z term can be reasonably assumed exogenous, it doesn't vary across repeated samples like the error term does, it's a fixed value. And when you have a constant, a fixed value inside the variance operator, we can pull it out of the variance operator and square it there's the trick. So we get 1 over z squared times the variance of u, 1 over z squared times variance of u of i, sigma squared i, but by assumption, what is sigma squared i? It's sigma squared, the constant value, times z squared, g of z. Those cancel out, and we end up with doot doot, the sigma squared. So whatever we had here if we divide through by its square root, it will end up canceling out. So our weighted least squares errors will now be homoscedastic. So the variances will be correct, the standard errors will be correct, the t stats, the p values, everything will work out if our assumption was correct and if we weight by the correct variable. Whew, I know, there's a lot of ifs uh, to get to that result. But that's what it should look like. Okay. So let's look at an example here. Go back to our wage model as a function of education and experience. We saw previously in our testing in part one that we do in fact have a heteroscedastic error and we could pin it largely on the variation in education. So for the purposes of our example here, let's 
assume that g of z is simply education, right? That the variance of the error term is proportional to the individual's level of education. So it's constant sigma squared times education sub i. So the only reason why sigma squared varies across i is because of education. So this is our g of z, so we wait, we divide through by its square root. In this case, we wait by 1 over education to the power of 0.5, square root of education. So to do this by hand in Stata requires us to generate all of these new terms. So we just use the generate statement. So we're going to generate the new intercept, so b0 underscore w equals just 1 over education to the power of 0.5. So that is going to give us the coefficient on that weighting term. Our new dependent variable, wage underscore w, will be wage divided by the square root of education. Now let's just kind of pause there for a second and again think about what we mentioned before that the variables that we're creating don't have to have an intuitive meaning behind them. If we just saw this entirely out of context and we said, wait, why are you trying to predict an individual's wage divided by their square root of education in years? That makes no sense. You're right. It doesn't make any sense. And it's just the baggage. It's just what we have to do to get the new error term that fits our assumptions, right? So then we go through our x variables, work experience divided by square root of education, and then education itself divided by its own square root. So that'll just be the square root of education. But because we divided everything by that same term, we're not changing the meanings of the coefficients, right? So we'll still be able to interpret them like we did in OLS. And once we have these new variables created, all we have to do is run an ordinary least squares model on our weighted variables. So it's our weighted dependent variable as a function of weighted experience, weighted education, and then we also have to include that weighted intercept term and use the no constant option because, again, we don't need a constant. What's playing the role of our intercept, our constant, is the coefficient on that 1 over root g of z. So these are now our weighted least squares coefficients. Interpret them as the change in y over the change in x, right, like we always do and we read everything else like we normally do. But if we got this right, now our standard errors, our t-stats, and our p-values will be correctly calculated, in the, no longer subject to the problem of heteroscedasticity. Now, in real life, what you'd want to do is, this turns into kind of a trial and error process, right? Based on our test, we have a good idea of what's causing the problem, we use different versions of that variable as a weight, and then we retest, right, each of our weighted least squares model for the presence of uh, heteroscedasticity, and hopefully we get one that passes the test, that no longer suffers from the problem, and that's where we would go, okay? But it's going to look something like this. This is the hard way to do it, right, to create the variables and run it with OLS. As you can probably imagine, Stata has a way to do this in one step. So in Stata ease, we just use the regress command with our original variables, y, x1, x2, and then we apply this analytical weight option. So in brackets, at the end of our command, our regression command, aw, the analytical weight, equals 1 over g of z. So the g of z in this case was education. Note that we actually want to be dividing through by the square root. Stata does that for us, right? So we just put in 1 over g of z, and behind the scenes, Stata is doing exactly what we just did by hand and giving us the same results, right? So the coefficients are the same, standard errors, etc., are the same. This makes it a lot easier to go through that trial and error process. You just plug in different values and different versions of your variables into that analytical weight. Now, as with everything else, there are more sophisticated ways of doing this. Uh, there are ways of estimating an optimal g of z function, uh, what we would call a, uh, a functional weighted least squares option. We're not going to look into that here. So this is just kind of the bare bones idea of, of how to apply it.
So, finally, what happens when you try and you try and you try to specify the appropriate heteroscedasticity variance equation with that weighted least squares and nothing seems to work? What do you do then? Well, now we go to the robust standard error option. Uh, again, the analogy is pretty strong with our previous discussion on the autocorrelated error problem. There, if you tried uh, applying a first difference, a generalized difference model, and it didn't work, there was some more complicated function that we couldn't quite pin down that was driving the error behavior, we would go to the Newey West robust standard error. Same thing here. We try and we try and we try, and we try with that weighted least squares option. If nothing comes up, we can go to the usually less efficient, but much uh, easier to apply robust standard error. And the main benefit here is we don't really need to know exactly what that formula is that's driving the, uh, the changes in that error variance. We'll get appropriate results. So again, this harkens back to our kind of original point of why we care about the heteroscedasticity problem and the short answer to that is, right, this formula for the standard error of the B1 hat OLS coefficient in a simple model is calculated as square root of the variance sigma squared over sum x minus x bar squared. But this obviously assumes that there is a constant sigma squared variance. When we use this formula, when the actual error is heteroscedastic, we're going to get all wrong answers, right? So what the robust standard error option does is just recalculates those variances, standard errors, and everything that comes along with it with the corrected, adjusted formula that doesn't have a sigma squared in it, that has a sigma squared i that allows for that variability across observations. And this is going to be known as the white robust standard error. So this goes back to a classic paper in 1980 that showed we can get consistent estimates for the variance term essentially by estimating the individual observations error variance with the squared residual. This is exactly what we did kind of intuitively with the uh, the so-called eyeball test, right? Where we squared each observation's residual and said, well, that measures the size, the scale of the, the residual, the error term, and the bigger that is, the more variability we would expect to see. The same thing is applied here. Again, there's a lot that goes on behind this to get us to this point, but this becomes now our adjusted formula. So we have our robust standard error for B1 hat, Instead of just sigma squared on top, it's sum x minus x bar squared times what is effectively what we'll call our sigma squared hat for each observation. So sigma squared i hat is that squared residual term. Okay, So we no longer need a homoscedastic error. We don't have to fix the error term. If we use this formula, that is the basic idea. Okay. Now, technically, if you actually wanted to replicate what Stata does for us, there is a built-in, somewhat ad hoc uh, degree of freedom adjustment here: sample size over n minus k minus one degrees of freedom times that term we just got. That would be the variance. If we take the square root of all that, that would be our standard error. And that's what is shown in the regression output when you use the comma robust option. Okay. In the more realistic case, when we have a multiple regression model, well, we know how to adjust that, right, from our discussion of the, uh, the multicollinearity problem and the variance inflation factor, we can show that the formula should be our degree of freedom adjustment times some x minus x bar squared times u hat i squared, and then on the bottom, some x minus x bar squared times 1 minus r squared, all squared, where that r squared is represented the correlation amongst our x variables. So that would be our robust variance calculation in a multiple regression model.
understanding it. If you had to, you could use that formula to replicate what, what Stata is giving us. Now to apply this in Stata, we just have our regression command, y as a function of x1, x2, comma, robust. And the default robust option is this white robust adjustment. So note it's not correcting for autocorrelated errors, only correcting for heteroscedastic errors. And what we should see if we put the two side by side, so these are the, the robust results here and the OLS original results here, we haven't changed how we're estimating the coefficients, so all the coefficients are exactly the same. With weighted least squares, you're going to get some differentiation there. But what we do see is different standard errors, different t-stats, and different p-values, potentially anyway. Uh, in this case, this is what we would call kind of a, a free ride uh, result, that using the robust standard error, while it did reduce our t-stats, a little bit from what we had previously, the levels of significance have not been affected. Everything was significant beyond 1%. They're still significant beyond 1%. So there's basically no cost to using the robust standard error option. So no real reason why you'd want to go through all the trouble of finding the exact right weighting scheme and using the weighted least squares option to try to eke out a little bit of an efficiency gain when it's really not going to affect uh, qualitatively our interpretation of our results. That's not always going to be the case. Sometimes you will have that incentive. Okay, so those are the three options for correcting for a heter heteroscedastic error. Uh, so hopefully you can go through that and make sense of it and see how to apply it. And thank you very much for your time.